if I could just share, if everybody on this podcast could understand how amazing it is to work at a place that respects, you know, the dignity of the human person that has a genuine love of the poor and has really solid business principles and a servant leader culture that mm -hmm. truly is here to, to serve. And it sounds like, oh, it's too good to be true. Welcome to another episode of the Latina Leadership Podcast. My name is Angelica Casares, and I am your host. On today's episode, I have Melissa McDonald. Melissa, hi, how are you? I'm fantastic. Thank you so much, Angelica, and thank you for having having this opportunity to, to be on this. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for accepting, one and foremost, uh, for coming on here. So, Melissa, I, have, I, I read up on you, so I know a little bit about you. But I always give the guests the opportunity to introduce themselves. So, um, comenzamos por Melissa. First of all, where were you born? Mm -hmm. Okay, and then who are you and what do you do? All right, perfect. So I was born in beautiful El Paso, Texas. Um, that's where my family's from. My mom, um, Alma, Angelita, and my dad, Jose. And McDonald is my maiden name. So we're the Mexican McDonald's from El Paso. My dad, my mom grew up in the Segundo Lario and my dad on Alameda Avenue, where his family owned an ironwork store that's still there to this day, right? Awesome. Um, so it's pretty cool. Um, so I was born in El Paso, but um, because my dad's job, he's a metallurgical engineer, um, his first generation college students, he went to, you know, school on the GI Bill because he had served in the Navy mm. and then came back to El Paso and studied uh, metallurgical engineering at Texas Western College, which is now UTEP. Um, and my alma mater is for undergrad as well. So um, because my mom and dad, I know this is like kind of strange, but, you know, they were married for almost 10 years and they didn't have any kids. So then they thought they weren't going to have kids. So my dad started accepting foreign jobs. Um, so as soon as, of course, he accepted it, all of a sudden, they, my mom was able to have children and she had like four of us, boom, boom, boom. Like we're all like 18 uh, months apart, less than 20 months apart. So she winds up with the, which I affectionately call ourselves the four little changos, you know, traipsing all over the place every two mm -hmm. to three years. So, um, so after being born in El Paso, um, we moved to, to Mexico and um, my sister was born, Yolanda was born in, uh, Irapuato, Guanajuato, and then my brother Joe was born in Buenos Aires, and then my brother Nick was born in Sao Paulo. Um, Y'all are so international, international. All over the place, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was kind of like, that was my childhood growing up and really influenced um, of growing up in, in um, a lot of South America, and then we come back to the States. So we lived in Houston for, we'd come back for, you know, do some stints there. Um, like Miami, Crown Point, Indiana, um, and then uh, rounding it out and going to high school um, in Mexico City. Um, so kind of, it was so fun, right? Most mm -hmm. people say like, didn't you hate moving every, you know, two, three years? And we didn't. It was like an adventure, right? You got to meet a lot of new people, see new places, and um, and really just appreciate everything that, you know, we have, I think it really did form us because when you grow up in countries, you know, all over, all over the place, especially in, in Latin America, you see how beautiful our culture is, right? The, the Latino culture, the Hispanic culture, and the melding of, you know, the races. Also, when we lived in Brazil and, and my parents lived in the Caribbean for, you know, a number of years, I know that really stank. <laughs> um, and also, they lived in Jakarta, but this is after we went to, I went mm -hmm. to school. So, but we had the opportunity to go and visit yeah. and you meet people from all walks of life and you see, you know, extreme poverty. Mm -hmm. uh, you see, you know, the wealth, but one of the things that always struck me is just the, the love and the culture and community of, of even those all, all peoples, right. Um, particularly, got really close with, you know, a lot of folks who, who helped us throughout the years um, and became, mm -hmm. they became familia with mm -hmm. us and just so much love and hard work and dignity. Um, 
And that just carries forward, you know, love of family and just work ethic. Um, mm -hmm. And when I came back to, you know, to the States, it was um, having to bring that kind of perspective to, you know, um, uh, to work and to friends that I had, because a lot of people really didn't, you know, travel a lot um, that I've known. Um, mm -hmm. But now that's changed, you know, yeah. today people travel a whole lot more. Yeah. So that's really um, ab about my background, mostly. Uh, I think that's marked by by that kind of experience and, and yeah. having that, those opportunities. Um, then um, went to uh, undergrad at UTEP. And uh -huh. I, okay, we're going to put it out there. I was one of those kids that at first wasn't really truly focused. I didn't really know what, what I wanted to do. I know that I did want to serve to help people. And I tried to uh, to convince my parents to let me go back to Brazil and, war and work with, in a ministry with Father Rum, um, who was working with drug addicted mothers um, mm. and their kids. Um, but they didn't think it was the best thing for me to, to go back there. So um, went to school and kind of was like, you know, like, what am I going to do? Um, then I started working part-time at the uh, El Paso Times in the newspaper industry and um, kind of part-time. I winded up having a 20-year career with Gannett. Um, worked in circulation. I worked in advertising, but the bulk of it was in human resources, um, which mm -hmm. is really fun because it was, that's how you get to work with you know, developing employees, employee relations, organizational development, and really being at all levels of the organization and across, you see, all how all the verticals work together. And it was just so much, it was so much fun. Um, and then um, left Gannett in 2008. Um, but, you know, the great economic downturn happened and um, I was part of a, a layoff. Mm. And you know what? At the time, I was bummed, but it was the best thing that ever happened to me yeah. because I got to go to law school. So yeah. here I am. I started studying for the LSAT, and I'm here. I am in my, you know, early 40s, and I'm like, I'm going to start a new career. And my husband was so, so supportive. So studied and and uh, went to school at, at Michigan State. Did my I say did my three years, <laughs> <laughs> and then my um. My second year, I interned at Raza Development Fund um, and just fell in love. And like, it was just mm -hmm. like, that's that was my that's my calling and have just been there, for, just celebrated my 10th year anniversary at the fund and with our familia. And it's just an amazing, amazing place. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about that. But it is um, really <laughs> If I could just share, if everybody on this podcast could understand how amazing it is to work at a place that respects, you know, the dignity of the human person that has a genuine love of the poor and has really solid business principles and a servant leader culture that mm -hmm. truly is here to, to serve. And it sounds like, oh, it's too good to be true. Well, I promise you it exists. <laughs> That's, you have an extensive, like, I, as I told earlier in the podcast, I said that I did read up on you a little bit. So it sounds like, what, first and foremost, it, it sounds like you go back to education every time you want more out of life. Is that, is that a fair assumption? Wow, that's really pretty astute. Yeah. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I, I have this admiration. Again, you know, I'm also one of those students who probably didn't focus very well and and education uh but i like learning i really really enjoy the process of it you know there's just some aspects that i just don't appreciate you know because mm -hmm. i'm not good at it but for those who want to continue their education in their young 40s what would you tell them i would tell them you know look i think um education is is critical but there's different ways of getting education, right? Mm -hmm. Before, and you know, it was like you must have your college degree because that's the only thing that's going to open doors for you. And you know, everyone, you know, it worked for a long time, and it and it has its value. But you got to put it in in context, right? Like, here's like we're all seeing it. You know, kids. I when I went to school, thank God, you know, for my undergrad. 
there was like tuition was like every semester was like $500, right? And then the next year, you know, 200 for books. So it was super affordable. And UTEP's a commuter school. So, you know, you worked and you went to school. So you weren't like burdened with all this, this debt, right? So education is very important, but really going in with your eyes open and saying, okay, what is it that I want to do? How much debt am I willing to take on if I have to take it on? Um, you know, really look for ways for scholarships and other opportunities to, to pay that down. Um, and then so that when you come out, you don't have to worry about, you know, that so much. Um, but there's also other ways to get educated. At, I think, I mean, there's, um, I'm excited about this because there's, you know, and especially in today's day and age, you can get like two year degrees yeah. um, and become a certified nurse, a programmer, and you start making really nice money and you can work, you know, you can go to community colleges to do this. Mm -hmm. um, and I just encourage, you know, it just to look at different options. Um, and then the trades are yeah. really super, super yeah. important and something that was kind of looked down upon in the past. But I tell you what, if you know, you know, you can be an electrician, a plumber, um, play with squeaky toys. <laughs> <laughs> She's okay. Um, um, it's, it's really formidable. And the other part of education is being open to learn from your, you know, from your parents, from your, your abuelitos, from your family, from your coworkers, being a, I call it a student of life. Uh, to mm -hmm. me, that's really super Super important. Um, the credentials, the diplomas, yes, they can open doors. But at the end of the day, if you don't have, you know, people call it the emotional intelligence or, you know, whatever the, the buzzword is. But it really is about knowing, being open and listening to people and learning and, and understanding that, you know, we share this planet. Yeah. <laughs> it's not all about you. It's not the Melissa show, uh -huh. that it's, you know, the us show. And really, um, it came, you know, it was a long time because when we all start off and this, this goes with part of the education is that um, you got to work hard. You got to establish your baseline and your expertise and your credentials and how you do yeah. that right? Through formally, through school, through experience. But if you don't have, you know, the, those expertise or that baseline foundation, um, you're doing yourself a disservice. So figure yeah. out what it is for you that it is. That would be my advice for, for, for young Latinas or, or young people everywhere is, um, um, so and then you figure out, you know, one size doesn't fit all. I yeah. get the the opportunity to do something that I love and it does well, you know, there's different motivations for, for work, right? Some people do it because they go and they get a nice paycheck and then they take that and they can spend quality time at home or, you know, there's, so again, it's not, but figure out what that motivation is yeah, and then, you know, build on it. Um, that's the beautiful thing about our, um, about, you know, the opportunities that we have, but yes, education, one size does not fit all and take advantage of, of the everyday learning lessons and just build upon that, you know? Yeah. That's an amazing message. Um, so in today's world, it is nice. It is nice to be able to kind of sort of shop around for your career, right? Mm -hmm. If you like something, maybe you can build on it, but even if you want to go completely left, you can still kind of be, because a lot of the times one one of the things I think, sometimes we don't understand that a lot of the skills that we have, they transfer, like they transfer. And all you're really doing is just educating yourself. Say you want to go from north, from nursing to like maybe a lawyer, but all those, you know, bedside tables and you're trying to be a lawyer, you're still trying to do that same thing. You're still acquiring the same skills to be transferred over. Yes. You still need to, you know, you need to get your law degree. You need to take the bar. You absolutely, you have to do all of that. But all those like mess ups that you would have done at the at the beginning of your career as a lawyer, you kind of learned them as say a nurse, you know, mm -hmm. it's, still, mm -hmm. it's still doable. It's still a thing. You can still do that. Um, so you mentioned a little bit about um, 
culture. So one of the questions that I did want to ask, as I heard that you guys were moving all over the world, right? Mm -hmm. you're, you're, I mean, when you're in Buenos Aires, I mean, y'all are all, everywhere. How did y'all stay tied in and connected into like the culture aspect? Was that like in part doing to your, to like your mom and your dad? Or is it, was it, did you not realize there was a difference? But like jumping all over the place, how did y'all do that? I think that that's so true. That's a funny story because I guess we really didn't feel like there was a difference. Um, you know, my mom and dad, um, you know, it, there was a language thing, right? Because it's like I grew up, my first language was Spanish and then it was Portuguese and English was like as my third language. Um, but culturally, my mom and dad have always been super inclusive mm -hmm. of of everyone, right? It's like barbecue at the house on Sunday. I, I do that still, you know, I can invite that, everybody yeah. in the world. <laughs> um, and like I said, growing up overseas is a little different because, um, you know, you, ha you tend to have um, help. And so when we had, you know, um, uh, like people like Yuma, who was like, when I was young um, and growing up in, in, uh, in Brazil, I grew especially close to her and her family. So my mom and dad, whenever we went to school, um, they would also pay for this, for the children of the ladies mm -hmm. who were with us to go to school with us. So we always, they were like our extended family or, or, oh, or you okay. know, and we would go to school together and come home and do homework together. You know, with Yuma's mm -hmm. kids, we would go over to where, where they lived and we would, she would make dinner and we would be there helping cook and then drink our Naval. We all hung out together. And, you know, it was, so I didn't see a difference. I didn't know I was different mm -hmm. until I remember we moved to Houston and I must've been like in second grade or first grade. And I remember standing in line in school mm -hmm. and then just kind of noticing that it was like the first time I realized I was Brown. I guess mm -hmm. that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so, um, but culturally, I don't know, I, because of what my parents, I think, taught us that people are, are, are not, you know, we're all essentially the same mm -hmm. inside. And it really, we, it wasn't about race or even socioeconomics because, you know, we, we hung out from company president to, you know, the kids playing in the streets and, mm -hmm. and there was no difference. And, and, um, we just had fun, you know, I, mm -hmm. I don't know how to describe that. There's not like, we're going to, and then my mom and dad exposed us, you know, as we moved around, we would go see different cities and try different foods. And they would always include, like, if we had our friends see, they were smart about that. Um, you know, bring, you know, little Victor or whomever, and they'd pile in the car with us and it'd just be like this fun adventure. Right. And, yeah. um, it was stopping at little stands and taquitos or, you know, to, you just run the whole gamut and you really, yeah. you know, it's, I never felt uncomfortable, you know, in a little, you know, going when we would get sick, they would send us to the pharmacy, you know, you go with the, you know, um, and they'd be like, go get a shot. So you'd go and be like, well, oh, me, my mommy, my dog thing, you know, I have to get a shot. <laughs> so, you know, the people who in the little pharmacy would take you in the back and then you psh, give you a shot and <laughs> come back. It's kind of, you know, um, or, you know, then also we had the advantage of you know, not feeling different when, you know, things you know, you went up to nicer restaurants. It didn't feel mm -hmm. like you know, we didn't belong. And that was a great gift because yeah, um, I just thought it was normal. Mm -hmm. But coming back and understanding that that's not normal for everyone, right? Yeah. And yeah. kind of getting that. It's all about that confidence and but in a humble way. Because people yeah. can be have confidence and be just rude and, and think that yeah. they're all that. But it's about having a, a confidence that you have respect for, for everyone yeah. and that for yourself yeah. too. Right. Yeah. And the I think your I think your, your parents had the self-awareness to be able to, to instill that within you, knowing that you might come across those biases as you were older. So you can always go back and like, hold on, but that's not the way 
I mean, because our childhood kind of shapes us mm -hmm. and then our adulthood just just kind of either reinforces or it becomes a place where we start to create change for ourselves and for our younger ones. The fact that your parents mm -hmm. have the self-awareness to be able to provide that and get that for you is huge and phenomenal because now you as a participant of the world get to also do that with the people you encounter. So kudos to your parents for, for providing that kind of childhood for you. It's amazing. Melissa, that was absolutely amazing. Um, so I want to pivot the conversation a little bit. So you mentioned you work for La Raza Fund. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There yeah, is an Raza Development Fund. Yeah. Raza Development Fund. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So talk to talk to me a little bit. And we're just pivoting because I definitely want to cover this because there's some initiatives within the uh, Raza Development Fund that I do want to bring to light because I do have some entrepreneurs, women entrepreneurs. I have some ladies who listen to this podcast strictly for gaining information. And I want to provide mm -hmm. that also, right? I want to give them you, Melissa, and your story, but also provide uh, resources for them. Mm -hmm. So can, let's, let's touch a little bit on uh, the Rasa Development Fund. Um, and overall, would you be able to give me a spiel of like, who they are. So you worked it for 10 years. So I'm hoping. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, Raza Development Fund technically is called, mm -hmm. what's known as a Community Development Financial Institution, CDFI. Okay. And you get that certification by being a mission-driven organization and you're certified by Treasury. And there's all kinds of different CDFIs, I think 20-some, but ours is a loan fund. So we, uh -huh. um, our support corporation, our parent company is Unidos U.S., uh -huh. um, yeah. formerly in CLR. And so uh, we were first started to, as one of our main directives is to support the, you know, 300 or so affiliates of Unidos U.S. Um, with access to capital. Because, yeah. you know, that was... That was a big part that was missing when NCLR was was there because they, they had the advocacy part on the po you know political side um, and kind of technical assistance with the organizations, but it was that that access to capital a critical part of what was needed into the equation of community development work, right? You know, so where do what space do CDFIs fill in, and then specifically Rasa Development Fund? So. Um, a lot of organizations, you know, they try to go and, and some of your women entrepreneurs is, you know, it, you probably have faced this challenge is that, well, you don't have, you know, all, everything that you need to get this primo, you know, qualify for a loan or, you know, get. Um, and that's the first thing is just having that access to be able to qualify for, for that kind of funding and that belief. Mm -hmm. So that's what the, the space that CDFIs kind of fill is that you know, um, we take more risk, mm -hmm. um, supposedly, mm -hmm. I say that supposedly, mm -hmm. because Raza Development Fund in the 23 years or so that we've been around, we've put out over $1.3 billion of loans into the community investments. Mm -hmm. And we have less than a 1% loss rate. Now you tell me that making investments in low income them. Latino mm -hmm communities mm -hmm. or communities of color is a bad investment. Mm -hmm. I take a 1% loan loss rate any time of the year. And so would our fellow uh, banking institutions. And it's not that, you know, I'm not bagging on them at all because they're great supporters and, and they have different regulations, right? They've yeah. got regulators coming in. We have more flexibility. Um, but we also, like I said, make a little riskier loans and take, you know, chances, mm -hmm. supposed chances, but we see them as Hey, yeah. we know that there's this amazing community out there that has a job to do and mm -hmm. is responsible, work ethic, and meets, pays back and meets their obligations, right? Mm -hmm. So Rasa Development Fund started 23 years ago, built on the Prince as a support corporation to Unidos US, then NCLR, built on three, you know, principles that carry us through this day. They're based on the teachings of um, John Paul II on the dignity of the human person, Mother Teresa's the love and service of the, the poor and strong business practices. All that feeds into our mission of serving Latino, Latino organizations that support Latino 
uh, communities throughout the country in the areas of education, healthcare, affordable housing, social services, and most recently into support of small businesses, minority small businesses. Mm -hmm. um, and it is such a pleasure to be able to do this because we're a national CDFI. We get to work with the Unidos U.S. affiliates and really become you know, we don't we don't have all the answers. We don't live in Houston. We don't mm -hmm. live in Atlanta. We you know, we know parts of the market, but our strength is in working with community partners, you know, who do know their business and their and their communities. And then we can support them um, because they're the experts. So but we have I love I love what we do because we are servant leaders. We go, we meet, we meet you where you are. Get to know the organizations. Who do you serve? Spend time, you know, with with the the, the with the whole organization, and often, you know, get to go and and sit in on classes or you know the some of the stuff that goes on when they have the kids there or the after school programs, just depending go to federally qualified health centers and sit with the doctors and the, and the team and see the families, you know, sitting in the, in the, in the, in the rooms, waiting rooms and, you know, mm. you know, strike up a conversation. Um, and you're just, feel, you're just close. Right. And then, mm -hmm. so it's kind of like carries over from what I was telling you when I was a child is like talking, you know, from th those who you serve to the decision makers and they're all, you know, valuable, as valuable as one another, but even more so is it that end user, you know, our gente, that's mm -hmm. who, who ultimately are, how we're programmed to serve, right? Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, what are we doing to serve our gente? Yeah. Um, yeah. So say I get a, I apply through one of the affiliates or I, I become an affiliate. I'm not sure well how that works there, but my question ref goes, to the actual, so I, I get a loan, right? Mm -hmm. You're not only the person who is investing, right? Kind of like, like, all right, here's the money, figure it out. Can I still use you as a resource? Yeah, yeah. So very much so. We just don't. It's making loans is easy, mm -hmm. right? It's We're not a faceless. We have a relationship, right? We get to know the organization, who you are, stay in, stay in touch. Um Gosh, there's organizations that we've been, you know, been been partners and supporters for 10, 15 years, you know, mm -hmm. and as they grow, we're able to help them in their next, you know, stages of growth. Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, mostly, um, yes, we are geared towards, you know, you know, those US affiliates are a priority, but it's not, you know, the bulk of what we do. Mm -hmm. Now we're working with them to become, you know, evolve that mm -hmm. their capabilities to be able to grow and you know debt's a tool mm -hmm. um it's a resource it is um but just giving somebody money isn't the answer to everything mm -hmm. right it's like being a parent it's easy mm -hmm. to write a check here go away boom <laughs> no you gotta have you know the the relationship the trust the guidelines you know we we're trusted partners mm -hmm. and we have, you know, an open door. If something's going on, you know, our our uh, our clients will call, and you know, we'll talk about it, and mm -hmm. we'll see how we can help. Um, and we just try to build our toolbox as much as we can, you know, not only with um, financial products, but also like with technical assistance or like mm -hmm. making connections. That's the other thing that I love. Networking. Here, right. Oh, Networking. It's like, yeah. Hey, you know, absolutely. Uh, uh, Arizona Hispanic, you know, chambers doing, you know, this works, this work program. And how is that associated over here with like maybe um, the Hispanic uh, women's corporation, or, you know, you should really talk to so-and-so in, you know, in LA or make, you know, make putting people together to leverage the resources to learn from one another um, is another big thing that Raza is able to do because of the mm -hmm. work that we know, the people that we know. Um, yeah. And 
and uh, vice versa. The community does it for us and our investors and our stakeholders are like, hey, you know, you should talk to so-and-so and so-and-so. And and so it's a two-way street. I mean, it's it's always yeah. that, which is yeah. just wonderful. I think, I think that, um, I think everybody's always just two, two to three. I'm a big advocate of networking and getting like, introducing myself. And one of the things that I learned is that I'm comfortable with it and not a lot of people are. And that's okay. As my, if you like, I believe like my network, if you know me and you know, you want a contact for me or you need something for me, absolutely. Just, I don't know what you need. So it would be just a form of asking. Right. Mm -hmm. And absolutely. I, I truly believe we are all only about two to three connections. You know, it's that three person degree, like separated right. two to three connections away from actually getting done what you need to get done to be able to get your business in the right direction or for it to like uh, for it to pivot or something to be able to make like money flow come in or to be mm -hmm. viable mm -hmm. um there's there's uh, there's so much that that's one of the things that money cannot buy is your connections it's you you right. know it's uh yeah so yes if I'm already thinking like, who can I send this? Like, like, okay, so let's start here. So if I wanted to apply or if I wanted to get more information and I, I was, you know, just, I want to, I'm being nosy, right? I'm one of those people. I want to get more information. Where can I go? Well, um, information about it. Okay. So we make mostly loans to like organizations, right. Mm -hmm. To, um, but since we're in the small business arena, uh, mm -hmm. now, um, Here's, I'll tell you how we're, we're approaching our small business lending at the moment. Okay. Um, it's working with organizations um, right now, primarily with the affiliates, but um, that have like certification programs, right? So if you're a member of the Arizona Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and you've been through, you know, some of their, their programming or um, been to their conferences and, mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we know that you've been through classes, like you were saying that support, like marketing, do you have a business strategy to, that strengthens it? You know, we're not the experts in all of it. We can't do it all. We don't want to do it all. Right. Mm -hmm. So we partner with the people who do, who are working with the organizations to say, here's our program at the end of it. You know, you, we know that you've, you know, how to, you know, how to do uh, your bookkeeping, your marketing, you have a mark, you know, a, a business strategy and a plan. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, some, they, you know, it's overwhelming sometimes. Look, our hint that they, we're going to, they get it done one way or the other. They're counting mm -hmm. if it's, um, there's no judgment, you know, when we've, a lot of times when we were meeting people early on and it still happens, they bring you their, you know, the receipts and they're all in <laughs> and that's their accounting. Yeah. And then if you, that's a place to start, right? That's okay. Now, how can we help connect you, you know, with CPAs or others who can, you know, but you have to have the, you have to have the trust, right? Yeah. Um, so that's something that we, we really believe in. So to answer your question, um, Get a, if we if you know one of our trusted partners and we want to build that out. So I'm great okay. with having this conversation. Right. Yeah. So, you know, um, I'm going to give you an example of, of somebody who's an incredible Latina. And I hope you have her on your podcast coming up. Uh, her name okay. is Stephanie Vasquez. And she's the owner of Fair Trade Cafe here in Phoenix, Arizona. But she's Vasquez. so much more than that. Uh -huh. um, you know, Stephanie's shop does sells coffee and, and delicious food. Um, but it's all about sustainability. She sources it, you know, from, um, um, uh, growers who she knows, you know, are being mm -hmm. responsible, both mm -hmm. you know, the folks that they hire or, and in fact, a lot of them are, are, are gente who have small farms and are having these, you know, are growing the coffee beans and, and stuff. So, um, so she's absolutely amazing, but she doesn't stop there. She's not only a successful businesswoman, but she pays it forward. So she started an organization called AYA, um, which is supports women entrepreneurs. Um, and out of AYA is the, uh, the uh, Mujeres Mercado. And it started about four years ago. And now she's got over 400 women-owned businesses at these mercados when she has them, you know, 
in the summer, it's a little hard, but, uh -huh. you know, <laughs> but yeah. um, during the rest of the year and in those mercados, it's like this, this, you know, everyone gets to know each other. They, they, you know, they share their stories. Hey, I was here when I started up, this is what I did, you know, and the, the technical assistance. So Stephanie brings that, that love and that passion and bringing people together. It's like, she's just absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. um, so I always tell her, this is my goal. That's going to be your goal too. When you meet her in Helica, I promise you. Okay. I want to see Stephanie Vasquez on a Modelo commercial, uh -huh. you know, with the beer and they say, meet so-and-so the tattoo artist. I want to be like, meet Stephanie Vasquez, you know, Latina extraordinaire, founder of Fairtrade Cafe, you know, and then of AM, Mujeres Mercado. And now she's wanting to start, you know, we're working with her um, in conjunction with um, um, the Maricopa Community College Foundation and their Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation to help her with a business strategy because she's going to start and she wants to, to have an incubator and a space so that she goes retail. So her mujeres on the mercado have storefront and in the mm -hmm. back there's an incubation period, so she, an incubator and accelerator so she can have, you know, she's talking about five in the front for the storefront and then in the back. So maybe at any given time, um, eight or nine businesses in there now in this space learning and from each other and then kind of just growing it out mm -hmm. uh, for additional retail space. And that's so, amazing. Um, yeah. So again, it's that partnership, right? It's mm -hmm. like knowing, knowing her, believing in her, promoting her mm -hmm. because she's promoting behind Stephanie is a hundred other Latina owned businesses that are all various stages of their of their, uh, where they are in their business journey, but more yeah. so a sisterhood. It's yeah. a, really, it's a sisterhood. Yeah. That's amazing. Here's the thing, you know, sometimes some of us, uh, sometimes some of us hit really, really quick, really early and we get it right. We get the business part. And by the time we know it, we are partnering with like big corporations, big companies, right. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it be, whether it be Walmart or like a Target or somebody to get our product in there, right? And we get, like, we hit the phases, right? We have three degree separation of network and we've been able to do that. Sometimes some don't. They don't. Um, it just doesn't work out like that for everybody. Everybody's career, everybody's path in the entrepreneurship world is different. You know, we all, we all like have that, oh, if you've been in business, you know, in three years, congratulations. You've been in five, you're amazing. You know, after 10 years, one out of every two business will have shut down or closed or something like that. And I was mm -hmm. like, dude, that sucks. Like, you know, so everybody doesn't have the same facet that everybody else does. And I think uh, it's hard. It's difficult out here to not compare yourself to other businesses or other business owners and entrepreneurs. So to be able to have, like you said earlier, to create that sisterhood of like, it's, you know, I, trying to make it work, trying to make it happen, uh, especially for the mm -hmm. Latinas who, and I read that it, they're the ones who are like initiating like small businesses they are faster, the fastest growing faster, segment, faster right? than we can possibly, you know, you turn around and you've got another 50, like going up, like we're tr like, we're trying, we really want to be in this space. So that's amazing. That's I, I'm definitely going to look into Stephanie Vasquez from Turret Cafe. So yeah, yeah she's <laughs> on my list now. <laughs> we'll like, we'll get her. Uh, she's absolutely, you know, awesome. talk yeah. about that. And so she, you know, if, You've got listeners, you know, have them reach out to, to mm -hmm. me and, okay. Um, okay. and then we have a great team. We've got um, Star Reyes and Francisca Montoya yeah. um, who really are focused on, on the small business lending and, and in Texas. Um, yeah. We have Frank Escobedo. Uh -huh. um, so, you know, we're a small but mighty team. Yeah. And uh, with just giant we just at the end of the day it's like you were saying about the network it's about caring right yeah. thinking like i know this person how can we help how can we you know because again yeah. it's not about you it's about us <laughs> yeah the yeah. overall picture it's about the bigger picture you know melissa this was amazing today I, first i want to thank you for your complete honesty and your complete transparency about uh 
about you know la raza about the raza development fund mm-hmm. and how you guys are gearing and how you are focusing i for me thank you so much because i have a better understanding now i'm like oh, okay so if i want to do part maybe if i don't if i want to do this right say i don't want to be an entrepreneur right say i want to <laughs> i want to start my own organization i can go in this direction or if i want to do a small business mm-hmm. i have another option i have both options to be able to to do that but thank you so much for your honesty and transparency today. Is there anything at all that I did not touch on that I did not highlight that you would love to talk about or you love to like input here? Um, I would just say, you know, um, keep follow us. We're, okay. you know, we're going to start our next chapter. We have a new president and CEO, Annie Donovan, who has just this. She's okay. She's she is number ten out of a family of eleven. Grew up in South Pittsburgh. She's like okay. She may not. She says may you know the Irish and the and the Mexicanos were very much related, like very yeah. con, very similar. Uh-huh. And uh, Annie, we're so excited about her coming on on board and and sharing her wealth of experience and her connections. Right. I mean, she she used to run the CDFI fund for four years. She was in the Obama administration. Um, she's another one that, you know, yeah. I want to try that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, just her wealth of experience. And we're going to learn so much from her. She's learning so much about our community yeah. and then going out and then tapping, you know, those, those resources to bring it back, mm-hmm. you know. So keep an eye out you know, to see what yeah. happens in the next couple of years, next year or two, it's just going to, you're going to see, you know, we talk about, we've put out $1.3 billion over our history, you know, what this is all like, you know, bank talk or, you know, mm-hmm. we've got yeah. so $700 million of assets <laughs> under management. That's all really great. S&P rating uh-huh. and all that. But, you know, our first goal is to take us to a billion dollars in assets mm-hmm. under management. And what does that mean is that we've got more resources to put out into the community. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's like but never losing who we are in our essence and our DNA and our in our culture. Mm-hmm. And the reason why we're here. Right. Um, it's not for the sake of growth, but it's for the sake of, of service um, yeah. to the community. So keep an eye out for that. Um, and. uh but just any young person out there who wants to talk about didn't realize or, or maybe someone who's looking for a second career, you know, do research on community development, financial institutions. Mm-hmm. If you've got, you know, financial background or worked for a bank or or if you've got great people skills, you know, research it. Um, I'm happy to talk to folks about that as, as a career option. There's, you know, CDFIs out there that are, are serving and, it's just so cool um, to be able to have found this, right? Uh-huh. Um, so uh, it's a blessing. Well, Melissa, thank you. First and lastly, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. I definitely, truly, truly enjoy this. But bueno, I, I do definitely want to let you go. I want to let you get back to your beautiful dogs and, and the rest <laughs> of your day.